as usual, we will have our review session on Friday, exam on Monday, 50 multiple choice questions, single answer, big blue scantrons. Any questions about that at this point? Other than what will be on it, everything that we've covered through today's lecture. Um, old exams should all be on D2L. If for some reason you can't find them, it may be that I have some exams that don't have keys or have keys and don't have the exams that don't have the keys on them. Just let me know and I will post all of those. It should be under old exams in D2L. Yeah, Nicole. Uh, um, last year, 17, there's only two. Uh, that was known. Do you know if there are only two? Okay, so um, comment that last year's are just keys. That's because when I transfer the files from last year, I just transfer what was posted, and I don't post the non-keyed exams there. So please send me an email and remind me, and I will upload the ones that don't have the answers already marked on them. I will do that, just I need to be reminded, and if you tell me now, I will forget, I promise. <laughs> so uh, there's also a group of people who are going to be meeting me tomorrow at 9.30 for an extra review session, um, extra office hours, because I know a number of people have class right after this. So 9.30, either in my office or potentially in, I think it's room 436, which is a conference room also on the fourth floor of SRTC. So um, if you're planning on coming, again, maybe drop me an email so I'll see if we can m reserve that room for that time. Shouldn't be a problem, but we'll see how many people are going to be able to come to that. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> how does it work with the mid? So, just in terms of just functionally how it works with the midterm. Yeah. So, there is a class right after this um, on Monday. So, you can have as long as you like. Um, we can either move to tables in the back, or there are also a bunch of tables outside. So, I will be here as long as you need. So uh, that being said, I've also plotted how people do in terms of when they turn in the exam, and it's a flat line. So staying longer doesn't necessarily help. And I've heard a lot of people, again, talk to your neighbors about the, my exams, and people say, oh, they've gone back and changed the answer to the wrong one after they've picked the right one. So um, staying for a very long period of time may work for you. And again, I don't want to give you any time pressure, but it may or may not help. The other questions about the exam? Yes, no, we're all ready for it. We're going to get 100%, all of us. I don't think I've had any 100% on my exams yet. I certainly wouldn't get 100% on my exams. Um, so if that's any consolation, which it might or might not be. <laughs> so I want to just very briefly finish up with what I promised at the end of lecture last time, is that we'll talk about packaging of the genome into PHIX-174. <clears throat> and just for review, PHIX-174 has this interesting, I think fascinating, but I'm a little bit biased, way of assembling, which is really quite different than really any other virus we're going to talk about in this class, having to do with internal capsid scaffolding proteins and external capsid scaffolding proteins. And they come together as these pentamers, first to the F protein, then the G protein, and then this internal scaffolding protein, the B protein, which is ridiculously flexible in terms of its sequence, um, and you can actually even get rid of it. The D protein binds on the outside and helps each of these pentamers come together to form this procapsid structure. So internal and external scaffolding proteins are very rare that you've got both of these. But forming a procapsid is very common. And so this is the precursor to your final capsid protein. And there's a couple of reasons for that we'll just get into. Yeah? I think you just answered it, but I have another question related to it. Okay. Uh, so a, vir a virion is the capsid plus the DNA or RNA on the inside, or a virion is just the external structure? Okay, so the question is basically what's the virion versus the capsid? <laughs> 
And so those are two um, important differences. So the Virion is the whole shooting max. So it's the capsid plus the genome. Um, on the other hand, the capsid can be just the protein. And in this case, the procapsid is literally just protein. Yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah, this looks like a typo there. Well caught. <laughs> yeah, so B and D proteins um, have a flexible sequence and structure. And we'll actually see, particularly this is important for the D proteins, and we'll see that in just a second, um, how it becomes pretty interesting. So if you just now look at this um, procapsid structure, this we didn't look at last time, a couple of things should be pretty obvious about this. The first one is that it's clearly a lot bigger than this one, which is kind of bizarre because, wait a minute, you know, this is without genome and this is with genome. Um, so that's one thing. Um, the other thing, and this is probably why this is the case, is there are holes in this procapsid structure the D protein is still here. The D protein is, is lost in this case. And these holes at the threefold axis are important for what? Getting that genome inside. Exactly. So that was, again, what I promised last time. So let's take a quick look at it. So <clears throat> the C protein, which we haven't talked about yet, um, is a protein which now will associate with the rolling circle replication. Remember, that's the rolling circle, which is started by the A protein cutting and giving you a 3'OH, the cellular machinery replicating around the genome, and then the A protein religating that single-stranded piece back together. Together with the C protein, <clears throat> now you end up with this present and associated with these procapsids, and then the J protein which seems to serve as a single-stranded binding protein, will bind to this single-stranded DNA inside this structure. And the first question I would ask is, where the heck is the H protein? And the answer is, we don't know. Uh, that's the one which forms this amazing tube-like structure, which then will release the genome when you have association of these particles with the receptor and the host which is going to infect. Once you have packaging of the genome, and this process, putting the genome in, seems to push this internal scaffolding protein out. And so the internal scaffolding protein is sort of holding everything together. When you start packing the DNA in, there's not enough space for protein and DNA, and so that protein comes out. And again, how does it come out? It comes out through those holes in the procapsid structure. Once you have a completely filled, now, virion, now the D protein dissociates, and you have your final virion um, right here at the end. And in fact, you can also see here, as a kind of a follow-up to your question about whether it's a capsid, when is it a virion? We had here a, oops, back up one, a pro-capsid, i.e. no genome. Here we have a pro-virion, because it's got all of the nucleic acid in it. And then the final virion is after the, the mature and now infectious virion that we have at the end. So virion is capsid plus nucleic acid, and capsid is then before you have that nucleic acid. Okay, now, what haven't we talked about yet? It's on the next slide. How you get out? So these are naked particles. There's no envelope around them, so they can't fuse with membranes to get outside of the cell. They have to break open the cell. And the way that they break open the cell is actually really kind of an interesting one. It's a <clears throat> protein which functions a lot like the antibiotic penicillin. So any of you remember what penicillin is? I'm not going to go down the list and find it. Because I'm not sure if everyone's taking microbiology. Yeah, so it inhibits peptidoglycan formation and stops growth of cells. So it's exactly what's happening in the same case here. It's blocking that cross-linking, and so the cell membrane just becomes weaker and weaker and weaker, and eventually will fall apart. But that lysis is actually due to cell growth. So if you stop cell growth, 
you're not going to get production of virus. So that's the, that's the process here. And so it's not like forming a hole in the membrane, which is what we'll see happens with a lot of these other viruses. It's literally waiting for the cell to grow but not be appropriately cross-linked in its peptidoglycan and then fall out. <clears throat> so that's the whole process with these FIX-174. I wanted to very briefly mention some work that, to be completely egotistical, my lab has done, looking at some other microviruses. So <clears throat> we mentioned right at the beginning that a number of microviruses not like FIX-174, the so-called Gokusho viruses, these are the viruses that infect the intracellular parasites. So they infect chlamydia, infect Bedella vibrio, et cetera. And if you just <clears throat> look at the sequences of these particular viruses, they all end up in various clades. And again, this is just comparing sequences. These sequences are pretty closely related to each other. Turns out FIX-174 is pretty distantly related to a lot of these Gokusho viruses. But as I showed before, when you think about single-stranded RNA virus in the environment, there are a whole bunch of them, um, including in our favorite hunting ground, which is a place called Boiling Springs Lake in Lassen Volcanic National Park in Northern California. And Boiling Springs Lake is just like that. The low temperature is 50 degrees Celsius. The high temperature is 90 plus degrees Celsius. The pH is 2. So it's a pretty extreme environment. Um, so we were quite interested when we got some sequences from that environment and we found these sequences that looked a lot like microviruses sequences. So this you know, BSL 1436 and 1013. Then a graduate student of mine, Jeff Diemer, um, looked at the structure of the major capsid protein here of this putative microvirus, and then also looked at all of the D proteins. And I remember the D proteins, what are those? External scaffolding proteins, exactly. And as I mentioned before, they're, they've got lots of flexibility in terms of their sequence, but also lots of flexibility in terms of their structure. And so this is now predicted. We don't know that it looks like this, but our prediction is is that there are four different potential structures of this D protein that we found in our microvirus from this extreme environment and also, I think, correlates pretty well with what you see in terms of the D protein in the procapsid. And one thing that I forgot to mention, there's actually a atomic resolution structure of the procapsid. So we know exactly where all the D proteins are in FIX-174 in the procapsid. Um, but we think also a similar thing is going on here. And we think that this arrangement of the D proteins may actually be holding all of those capsid proteins together because this virion has to survive in these extreme environments, high temperature, low pH, et cetera. So any more questions on these small things? Everyone's grabbing their clicker, the ones who've had my classes before, so you know about where we're at. So again, um, we'll do the, you have a minute to do it by yourself, a couple minutes to chat, and then we go ahead and do it again. So let's go ahead and start. And if everybody gets it right the first time around, we can skip the discussion. There's going to be protein-protein interactions, which are important for that interaction, um, and specific to that threefold axis, because there's always going to be a threefold axis <laughs> on your particle, and right there just seems to be where the, the C protein is going to find. Yeah, well, it's as the replication is happening, the, the DNA seems to get inside. Okay, we're counting down here, and there doesn't seem to be a complete consensus. So tell your neighbors what you chose and why. 
Should I blank this part out of the recording? <laughs> The world, all the subscribers on YouTube, <laughs> they will hear you. <laughs> that virology student. <laughs> exactly, forget that lecturer guy. <laughs> Okay, we ready to vote again? Yes, no? On our marks? No? One sec. Okay, that's a sec, I think. Good, okay, let's go. He is not always right. I'm going with my gut. Like I was advised. We will all survive. There's only seven more weeks to go. <laughs> Five. Going with two? Going with two. So what are they? B and D. Are there more? <laughs> um, no, there's only two genes, but they can have very flexible sequences and structures. So as we just looked at, D, there are four different possibilities of structure. It's still exactly the same sequence in that particular virus. So, you know, flexible in terms of evolutionarily speaking, but not flexible in terms of the individual virions. So, the answer is yes, B. Just do. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to switch gears and basically get bigger and add an extra strand to your DNA phage. So this is now bacteriophage T7. It's the type 7 phage. Um, lots of people have worked with these phages over the years. And just a second here, we'll look at why people call them the T phages. Um, again, it's double-stranded DNA phages. It's also dependent on the host. But basically, the larger these phages capsids get, they're going to have larger genomes, and with larger genomes, they can encode more and more viral proteins. And so, sort of as we get bigger and bigger, in particular when we talk at the very end of the class, when we talk about the giant viruses, these are the ones that are becoming less and less dependent on host machinery. So, in the case of phage T7, there's a lot of its own machinery which it brings with us. So, with us, with it. Uh, these are the, <clears throat> again, the T phages. We'll talk about the type phages and why they're called the type phages. Um, and then one of the big keys as far as getting the genome of this bacteriophage inside the cell, it's dependent on transcription, which is really kind of funky. Why would you have transcription be important for a DNA virus getting its DNA genome inside the cell? And so we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then... One of the big take-home messages, and this is why most molecular biologists know about T7, is that there are a bunch of viral polymerases, both DNA polymerases and RNA polymerases, very interestingly. And so we'll, we'll talk about that um, as well. So a couple of key concepts as far as thinking about this particular virus compared to other viruses, and Stedman loves to do different virus comparison questions on his exams. Uh, so <clears throat> here, when we're thinking about regulation, and oh, pardon me, let me move this a little bit out of the way, how the genes are being regulated in the T7 genome, it's really about a process called promoter cascades. And we talked a little bit about this, again, in that class last term, um, where you have 
a gene encoding a protein, which is important for expressing genes that happen later, which then are proteins which are important for expressing genes that happen later. So that's what I mean by a promoter cascade. Um, the T7 RNA polymerase is an incredibly useful enzyme biotechnologically, but also really interesting from a structural point of view, and may even tell us something about the evolution of RNA polymerases and DNA polymerases. We've talked a little bit about early genes, late genes, et cetera. This is sort of the first example. We've got a really clear set of early, middle, and late genes. And again, this is something which we'll come back to talk quite a bit about later on. And then we haven't really talked about the concept of a concatamer. So what a concatamer is just literally multiple copies of your genome hooked up end to end. And it turns out that there are many viruses that will make their genomes as these concatamers. So multiple copies of genomes linked up end to end. So we always have to have our overview of any particular virus. Again, we'll talk about where it's from. This time, it's not from that place where you go and look for all of these interesting bacterial viruses. A different one, again, having to do with these T phages. Um, look a little bit about the structure. Um, this one's actually really convenient. You know, T7 is also a T equals 7 icosahedra, at least the upper part. Makes it really easy to remember. Um, and then how it gets inside the cell. This is also a really interesting process. And just like we had with FIX-174 and the H protein, is something which was only found since our textbook was published. So we'll take a quick look at that. Um, and then transcription. Again, it's these promoter cascades, but also the T7 DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. How the genome replicates, this is also mostly through viral proteins now, as opposed to using all the cellular proteins, like was the case with FIX-174 and the microviruses. And then if we get to it, we'll talk a little bit about the biotechnology, particularly using the T7 RNA polymerase itself. So where does phage T7 come from? Um, these are the, the T phages. And let me just switch over to this, the dot cam now and show you some of the T phages. So these are different viruses that infected E. coli that made different kinds of plaques on lawns. And so this one is T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, T6. Where the heck is T7? Actually, T7 makes plaques that look a lot like T3. Uh, but this was just in looking at plaques. They didn't have nice electron microscope images at the time. It was just literally looking at what infects what, and then we'll try and divide all of these up and say, OK, who's working on these viruses and who's working on those viruses? And unfortunately, what was happening at the time is everybody had a different name for their favorite virus. Somebody called it alpha. Somebody called it phi x. Somebody called it phi. Somebody called it. And it turns out these are all the same viruses. So there was a group of people um, known as the phage group who <clears throat> got together and basically said, you know, this is, we're going to work on all the same phages. And so everyone who works on a particular phage will be working on the same one as opposed to, is your alpha really the same as my 23 set slash 7, you know, et cetera. So that all came from the phage group. And these were all bacteriophage that infected E. coli, specifically the B strain of E. coli. And they were lytic. So they actually burst open the cells when they replicated. Um, T7, it turns out, is a close relative of T3. For a long time, people talked about the T-even bacteriophages and the T-odd bacteriophages. Um, because, and it turns out, T2, T4, and T6 are practically identical to each other. Again, they didn't know at the time. Um, and T3 and T7 are pretty similar to each other. But it turns out that T1 and T5 are really pretty different. Um, so <clears throat> that's um, T3. And so when I talk about T7, T3 is going to be practically identical. and we may get to that when we talk about the biotechnology a little bit later on. Where these came from was a commercial phage preparation. Why would you have a commercial phage preparation? OK, who's up on my list next? Um, did we have Brandon last time? 
Yes, that's what I thought. So Alex Chow, Alex here somewhere on the second page. I'm going to come up with a list again. You're going to come up again the next time. Um, Andrea Anya, yeah, there you are. Okay, so did they use these for isolation of specific proteins? And that wasn't, so remember, this is the 40s. So actually sometime even, even earlier than that when they're working on this. So what, what were people using phage 4? Looking for DNA, the replication of DNA was, that was particularly phi 174. What was Felix Durrell really famous for? <laughs> And is now coming back because we have all these antibiotic resistant bacteria. <coughs> so, putting you on the spot, it's not fair. So, um, phage therapy. So, these were literally a collection of phage that people were using to treat diseases with. And then they isolated the individual viruses from that. So, that's what the commercial phage preparation is actually from what they were using to treat diseases with. So that's where these particularly came from. Uh, another reason that people have really liked bacteriophage T7, um, and in fact, those of you, I know a few of you listened to This Week in Virology, um, Rich Condit, who has the, by far the best voice on that podcast, um, he did his graduate work on bacteriophage T7. And one of the reasons that he did his work, excuse me, his PhD work on that is that they're really good genetics in bacteria of HD7, and particularly a bunch of conditional mutants. And when we say conditional mutants, usually these are going to be temperature sensitive mutants. So the virus will replicate perfectly happily at a low temperature, but it won't replicate at a higher temperature. And in that process, you can map all of the genes. And so a lot of what we know, and we'll be talking about in the next few minutes, um, comes from that knowledge of which of each of those individual genes they were. Um, and then, more recently, people have found that these so-called potoviruses, poto is foot in Latin. How many of you had Latin? It'd be just me. I guess I'm getting old. Uh, <laughs> so the foot viruses, um, because they have these little foot, the tails are actually more kind of like feet. And it turns out that these are ridiculously common viruses in the environment, um, also in various different pathogens, which means they're also good for phage therapy. So a um, couple of other reasons to be interested in these particular viruses. Um, T7, again, this is really easy because T equals 7 head structure. Um, and <clears throat> I tried to draw that out on here. Um, I brought a few more of my T equals 3 um, particles here. I'll bring some more on Friday. So you need to get from five-fold axis of symmetry to five-fold axis of symmetry passing through the hexameric subunit. So there's one hexamer, here's another hexamer, and then you go over one. So an H of 2 and a K of 1, H squared plus HK plus K squared, is equal to equal 7. So that's this, this head structure. That's great, but it's also got this really fascinating foot structure down here. One thing that I know all of you are counting very carefully, which is rather strange, is if you look at these tail fibers, or the feet, how many of them are there? One, two, three, four, five, six. But it's a five-fold axis of symmetry. So there's this mismatch in terms of symmetry at one of these five-fold axes of symmetry. Um, that mismatch here is mediated by the portal protein. Um, portal proteins actually have 12 subunits. They're incredibly common in bacteriophage. So if you're just looking in sequences that you find in the environment, you think you've got a bacteriophage just finding a portal protein sequence. They're very well conserved. Then we have all of these tail proteins. They've got these ridiculous names here that I'm not even saying because I don't expect you to remember them. Um, and then on the inside, you have a core set of proteins. And these are literally on the inside of the capsid. And we'll see where those are uh, in, well, a second or really kind of towards the end of the lecture. But they have a, a very structured set of core proteins literally inside this capsid. And I'll give you a little bit of a guess to think about what they might be doing. What do we see for phi x174? What do we, scaffolding proteins? But scaffolding you don't have when you have a final virion. 
because that's one of the definitions of a scaffolding protein. Getting through that membrane. And so conformational changes that happen in these proteins to make a tube that goes through here. So what's packaged inside this head other than those core proteins? It's a genome. Um, and it's a 40,000 base pair linear, double-stranded again, DNA genome with unique ends. And we'll talk about why unique ends are important uh, a little bit later on. Um, if you think about how big 40,000 base pairs are, just lining up in B-form DNA, that's 12 micrometers in length. Okay, 12 micrometers doesn't sound like a lot, but the diameter of this is about 50 nanometers. So you're trying to put 12 micrometers of DNA into a you know, 30, 40 nanometer structure. A very challenging process is the high school students that I talked to in Salem about a week ago with my OMSI um, outreach was you know, trying to put a piece of yarn into one of these capsid structures. It's hard. It's really tough. And so you end up with a very <clears throat> compacted DNA inside the capsid. And we'll see that um, in just a second here. And it turns out that these strands are really easy to separate relative to each other, which also makes it a really useful tool for just studying DNA replication. So what does that genome look like? Um, this is the genome that I think, as they mention in the textbook, you know, could have been designed by an engineer. And that was my first degree. But basically, a very organized process where you have early genes followed by <clears throat> your, I should say the early, and then these DNA metabolism genes, or middle genes, and late genes. These early genes and DNA metabolism genes, of course, they're important for replicating your genome. Then we've got these you know, late genes, which are very on structure and assembly. Again, it makes perfect sense that you would organize a genome in exactly this fashion. Um, so again, the engineers are the ones who decided um, how this would work. A uh, couple of important things here. These are the numbers on the top here, which again are ridiculously confusing. You remember I mentioned, you know, the GP13, GP14, et cetera. Those are the parts of the capsid protein. Um, but then we have a GP.3, GP.7. Okay, well, how do you heck do you get those? Well, it turns out people had discovered all these other genes by genetic processes, and then they were doing more genetics, and they found these genes that were in between these other ones. So you can't really call you know, this gene one, and you know, this is a gene in between that. And so these are extra genes that were found later on. So again, we're not going to spend too much time thinking about this, but um, this is all a genetic process. So all of these genes were named uh, based on their genetics. And we'll look at the transcription here, um, how this is being regulated um, a little bit later on. So the first thing, what happens when you have a virion floating around, it's got to bind to the host and then somehow get into that host. Binding, as it turns out, is really similar to binding that you have with Phi-X-174 binds to lipopolysaccharide. So outside, again, not a protein it's interacting with. This is now a lipid plus sugar. And then this core basically drills its way through the membrane. So again, it's a conformational change. And we'll take a look at that in just a second here. Um, and then about 850 base pairs of the genome is released. But that's 850 base pairs. Wait a minute. It's 40,000. That's really not enough, is it? So what happens? Well, it turns out that once that 850 base pairs get in, they have a really strong promoter for the E. coli RNA polymerase. So those 850 base pairs come into the E. coli. The E. coli DNA-dependent RNA polymerase binds to that promoter and starts transcribing. And in that transcription process, it starts pulling in a lot more of the genome until it gets to TE. So what the heck does TE stand for? The termination of transcription. So termination of early transcription right here. So these transcripts are all being made by the cellular RNA polymerase. So that's basically what this looks like. Um, and this is where we move away from the text, again, because these are new things which have been discovered since then, um, is using a process called tomography, which is taking lots of pictures 
of your virus associated with cells, and then making cute cartoons to try and interpret all of these individual micrographs. So here are the micrographs up here. These arrows are supposed to represent these tail fiber proteins. And what they saw was really quite interesting. It looks as if these tail fiber proteins will interact with LPS and then dissociate and interact with LPS and dissociate and interact with LPS. And then finally, you have a case where you have all six of these tail proteins associated with the LPS and potentially a secondary receptor, a co-receptor. And then you have this conformational change which has the core, which is otherwise on the inside, which basically everts and makes a hole. Then 850 base pairs come out here. So now let's take a quick look at how people think this happens. A lot of this is rather speculative, but it's a really cool animation in any case. So <clears throat> you can take a look at this. This is from science from a few years ago. Um, again, animation put together for all of these individual still pictures of bacteriophage C7, this is the capsid, and the tail protein. There's that core which is present on the inside. If you just turn this around, again, turning it around inside the cell, we're still missing the tail fibers. So where are the tail fibers? Turns out that if you just look at the virion, they're kind of attached to the rest of the virion. They seem to be folded up. And then when you have <coughs> interactions with the E. coli, each of these pieces seems to just basically fold up and down, fold up and down, and basically sort of looking for your lipopolysaccharide on the surface of E. coli, which is this green thing which you can see down here at the bottom. And then when you have these first interactions, it seems that these guys walk around on the surface of E. coli until they find an appropriate place to have all six of these interactions. And again, probably a co-receptor that associates with this tail right here. Then you have all six of the fibers that bind. Now we have that conformational change. Remember, the core was in here. That core then will undergo, again, conformational change. I'll probably say conformational change about 6,000 times in this lecture, the term. Um, that conformational change now takes this core and averts it, making a hole through both the outer membrane and inner membrane. And now 850 base pairs come into the cell, which now has this promoter for the E. coli DNA dependent RNA polymerase, which is going to start to pull more and more inside the cell. Let's shift back over to here. So this is another cartoon form. Again, we've got the core. Here's our DNA. Conformational change. About 850 base pairs come in. The RNA polymerase, again, cellular RNA polymerase, will start to transcribe, pull in this. And since transcription and translation are coupled to each other, David, I'll be with you in just a sec, um, you start to translate these proteins that are encoded for in this first 850 nucleotides. Yeah? So the, the question is, is uh, basically, I'll, I'll paraphrase here, is what's, where's the specificity coming from? Is the specificity due to you know, the projection of the core, or is it their tail, or the tail fibers per se? It actually seems to be tail fibers and core. You actually have to have both interacting before you have the conformational change. Yeah, Nicole? Yeah, so again, the, the question again, and correct me if I'm misunderstanding here, is do, do the tail fibers have different specificities? Um, and the answer seems to be no. That they're all exactly the same protein, they seem to have exactly the same structure, and so they're just binding to LPS. And that LPS interaction um, presumably then helps it get to somewhere where you have the interaction, as David was pointing out, with the tail structure, which is not the tail fibers. Um, and so presumably you have to have the appropriate arrangement of six LPSs around wherever this um, secondary co-receptor is. I think the co-receptor is not entirely clear what that is. 
Okay, so injected cellular RNA polymerase, these proteins start to get translated. Um, what are these particular proteins? They're the early ones, and probably the most important of these is GP number one. Uh, so, also known as these class one genes. GP number one is a T7 RNA polymerase, so a DNA dependent RNA polymerase. And I'm not gonna, well, I'll let anybody answer this question. What's really bizarre about this DNA dependent RNA polymerase? Yeah, so it's not one sub, it's not a whole bunch of subunits that come together. It's actually just one protein. And that one protein looks a lot like what? Redeemed yourself. There you go. Uh, what other structure does it look like? You know, obviously, it kind of looks like a right hand, which looks like a DNA polymerase. Whoa, wait a minute. This is a the DNA polymerase structure, but it's making RNA? That's really bizarre. And as we'll see later, it turns out that a lot of the RNA-dependent RNA polymerases also look like these DNA polymerases. So if you think about the evolutionary process, and probably we had an RNA world before we had a DNA world, these were probably the original RNA polymerases, and this is probably the original DNA polymerase. And so cells eventually figured out that a DNA polymerase actually worked better than these RNA polymerases. And so this single subunit, and this turns out to be incredibly useful um, in terms of biotechnology, putting a whole bunch of subunits together for a RNA polymerase, be it bacteria, you've got beta, beta prime, alpha, omega, um, and then if you think about the eukaryotic polymerases, they've got 12 to 14 subunits. Um, having a single subunit, DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, is really good. The other thing, which is really good about this polymerase, is it cranks. It's really, it's way faster than any of the cellular DNA-dependent RNA polymerases. About twice as fast. Uh, then what do you have with all DNA-dependent RNA polymerases? You have a promoter, so it's a specific sequence that that polymerase is going to bind to. Um, these promoters, not surprisingly, because this is a completely different structure, don't look like minus 10 or minus 35. They don't bind to Tata boxes and BREs. They have a very specific and very different sequence which they're going to bind to. Okay, so this is the first of those particular um, proteins. More questions about this? We can ask another clicker question. Yes? No? Maybe? <laughs> Go for it. Again, got a minute for this one, and then um, we can have discussions. Let's actually start it. That would help. Um, if everybody gets it right, then we won't discuss. If there's any discussions to be had, we'll have discussions. And I get to have a drink. It's water, trust me. We're going to have to go a ways until we actually get a consensus. We get to have a discussion. And I'm sure some of you are pressing back extra buttons because we don't want to go for too much longer. <laughs> okay. Tell your neighbors what you selected and why. <laughs> 
So the voice level is going down. That means people are all happy with their answers. Yes? OK, let's try again. Yeah, and you can keep chatting. There, you got another, you know, if you want to, if you're not completely finished with thinking about this. Vote often. Okay, so <clears throat> we're um, divided. I did not tell you the answer to this question. I expected you to extend and think. I know thinking. God, how hard to do that early in the morning. Uh, <clears throat> uh, about what? made sense. So I heard people muttering up here in the front row that the T7 RNA polymerase is really good in terms of replicating really fast. Also it binds to different promoters um, and that is in fact what does the pulling in of most of the genome. I mentioned that about a fifth of the genome comes in with the cellular RNA polymerase but the rest of it is all brought in by the viral RNA polymerase. So it's the viral RNA polymerase which is doing this and it's the transcription. Nobody liked my other answers though. I need to come up with better other answers for these things. <laughs> it's nice to be able to <sighs> not such a good thing. We shall see. Okay, any more questions about this by the way? The yeah. Mario? So, yeah, the most, m the key here is most of the T7 genome. It, mm -hmm. yeah, that is correct, exactly. So, first 850 come in, they have a great promoter for the cellular polymerase because there's no viral polymerase at that point. Those first, and actually it's the first 850 that then come in, then that pulls in the first fifth, which includes GP1. That then gets translated, and we have that TE, which stops all of the cellular polymerases, and then the viral polymerase will come in and take the rest of it. Now, as you all remember, I'm sure, there were some other genes before you get to GP1. So what are those other genes, and what are they doing? Well, one of the reasons that you only have 850 base pairs that comes inside the cell is these cells have these things called restriction endonucleases, which are really useful for recombinant DNA technology. But that's not why they evolved. <laughs> why did they evolve? OK, Amy Lee, you have absolutely no clue. What do you think? What are we talking about in this class? Viruses. 
So what would the restriction en enzyme be doing? Yeah. So it chops up viral DNA. So anybody know what, why they're called restriction endonucleases? Yeah, no, actually that turns out actually not the case. So it's restriction in terms of restriction of host range. So which cells can be infected by which viruses is that restriction endonuclease. So it's say the restriction is restricting host ranges. So that's where restriction endonucleases come from. So all of you, when you're using your restriction enzyme, you know it's really a viral defense mechanism and not evolve to make it easier to clone your favorite gene into something. Yeah? They restrict the host range. So we restrict which viruses can infect which cells. So it's restricting, again, restricting the hosts that can be used by a particular virus. So what does GP.3 do? It inhibits the restriction endonucleases, so that genome doesn't get chopped up. And so when that first, why you only have 850 nucleotides that come in? That's because you don't want your genome to be chopped up. And so you first gene that you make stops the cell from chopping up the rest of the genome which is going to come in. Gene 0.7 blocks the E. coli RNA polymerase. Why would you want to block the E. coli polymerase? Because you've got your own. You don't want the cell spending all of its good energy on making its own genes. You want it to be spending all of its energy making your genes. So again, to totally over-anthropomorphize here. But um, this is also what we will see quite commonly in other virus infections, is one of the very first things that happens, even before making more of the genome, is getting rid of the host functions that you don't need and getting rid of host defenses against that virus infection. So the very first thing that you need to have as a virus to make sure you're going to have a productive infection is to, you know, get rid of any of the host stuff that you don't want or could potentially be deleterious to virus replication. So we'll see this happen again and again. It's not, you know, Restriction and nucleases don't happen in eukaryotic cells, but there are other processes um, that we'll talk about later. Yeah, Margo, in the back. Yeah. 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 So, question about the, and basically the T7 RNA polymerase, is it processive? Um, and the. So how does the, the, okay, so the host RNA polymerase, how does it stop so that it, you know, you can have then transcription taking place by the T7 RNA polymerase? Yeah, so it's a, that TE that I mentioned before, that's a transcriptional termination site and a very good transcriptional terminator. I forget if it's row dependent or row independent. That I'd have to go and look up. <laughs> um, but if we just think about it like the big hairpin loop that forms in your RNA, hairpin loop and a whole stretch of A's, I'm guessing that's what it is. I'm not absolutely certain, but I'm guessing that that's what it is. So yeah, so that's, you've terminated, you know, th at that point, that E. coli polymerase is done. You've made this GP.7, which is inhibiting more of that transcription from taking place. And you've got your T7 polymerase and it's going to start transcribing a whole bunch more genes. What are all of those genes? Those are the genes that are important for making viral genomes. So <clears throat> the lots and lots of them, 1.32, 2.53, 3.54, 5, um, Stedman will circle the ones that he's going to spend more time talking about, so they're more likely to be on the exam. Um, so particularly GP3 degrades host cell DNA, and is also really important for breaking up concatamers. So, oh, as my pointer here is deciding to freak out on me. Okay, let's switch over to doing this pointer. Uh, <clears throat> so this particular endonuclease will get rid of host DNA, 
um, by binding and cutting at very specific positions in the genome. It's a very specific endonuclease. Um, and it turns out that this is found at the very end of each of those T7 genomes, also that same site where that endonuclease cuts. There's also a lysozyme. This lysozyme is important for making the hole in the membrane when you actually have the virions coming out of the cell. But it turns out it's also important for inhibiting the T7 RNA polymerase once you're done transcribing everything. Because once you've done all your transcription, that's going to get translated. You don't need to necessarily be transcribing any more. And so in inhibition of T7 RNA polymerase, this, just like making holes in the cell, is concentration dependent. So you just get more and more of this lysozyme, not at all unlike the lysis protein that we saw in MS2 and Cubeta, which just accumulates to a certain point, and then you have cell lysis that takes place. And then uh, GP5 here is a DNA polymerase. So this is now a DNA-dependent DNA polymerase. And what this tells you is you don't need that cellular DNA-dependent DNA polymerase. This is now a <coughs> viral DNA-dependent DNA polymerase. So getting back to, I think, uh, Margot's questions here about how all of those other genes are being regulated, we had this termination site here, um, TE, termination of all these early genes, and then all of these binding sites for GP1. And again, these are those specific binding sites for the T7 RNA polymerase. All of these will bind. There are a number of different terminators here. Turns out that the <coughs> T7 RNA polymerase is not real good at terminating, um, unlike the RNA polymerase that you find in the host, which has these very specific termination sites, that um, is not terribly good. And so what happens is you have lots of transcripts that start at different places. Many of them are longer and longer. And you end up making the most of these proteins right here, 7, 8, 9, which are, even without knowing what would you guess that these are encoding, structural proteins, and particularly the capsid protein, exactly because these are the ones that you need the most of. And then um, you have RNase-3. RNase-3 is pretty well known in terms of CRISPR-Cas, but it's really good at processing 3' ends and mostly protecting 3' ends from getting degraded. So these transcripts actually turn out to be very stable. Most E. coli transcripts are not very stable. Um, but if you have this processing, you can stabilize these transcripts. And then you have these late promoter genes um, which will be making all of your final proteins. What are they? Um, they're the major capsid proteins, but then also this portal protein. Um, again, we mentioned that that's what provides the adapter between the five-fold axis of symmetry and the six tail fiber proteins, scaffolding proteins. Again, this is just a single scaffolding protein. It turns out to be an internal one. Capsid protein 10, et cetera, various different tail proteins. And then the last one I wanted to mention here is the a holin protein. So holin does exactly what the name sounds like. It actually literally makes a hole. And that's partly because, again, these are infecting E. coli. How many membranes do E. coli have? Two. Where is lysozyme working? Lysozyme works on the peptoglycan, just like we were talking about in terms of how Phyx-174 gets out, works on peptoglycan, but only on growing cells. These guys now can actually break open cells that are not actively growing because they've got a hole in it that lets the lysozyme in, which then starts to break it down. How do you make these last genes? The consensus sequence for the T7 polymerase is better. And <clears throat> these um, promoters just end up making more of your messenger RNAs and, again, GP10, right here, that's your major capsid protein. That's the one you have the most transcripts for. And again, finally, after you've made enough of the lysozyme protein, it starts to inhibit the T7 RNA polymerase. So you have these stable transcripts, which are going to get translated. And then you need to package your genome. Well, how do you make your genome? We already mentioned that one of these class II genes is a viral DNA-dependent DNA polymerase. So viral DNA de dependent DNA polymerase, just like all DNA polymerases, what do you need? You need a template and you need a primer. Where does that primer come from? 
So it turns out there's actually a T7 primase, and that can actually put down RNA primers. But the very first primer, which is used by T7 DNA polymerase, is actually made by the T7 RNA polymerase. It's a transcript. And those transcripts get cleaved by RNase 3. And not surprisingly, transcripts are also complementary to the DNA. And so that's where you start the replication process. Once you've started the replication process, then the T7 primase can bind to opposite strands, make primers. Those get extended in completely classic semi-discontinuous replication. So you have Okazaki fragments. Those get ligated together. You've got RNase H, et cetera. This process here ends up generating, and the process how it happens is a little convoluted, and we're not going to get into it, uh, these genomes, which are hooked up end to end to end. And so you have multiple copies of your genome. So genome copy one, genome copy two, genome copy three, genome copy four. Those then get chopped at the right position for each single genomes when they get packaged into the virion. So we'll talk about packaging next time, but before we all run away, everyone gets a chance to get 100% on another clicker question. So let's do it. <clears throat> what makes the first primer used by T7 DNA polymerase for replication? Come on, let's turn this on and let me go. Go. And since there's just two minutes left, go ahead and discuss with your neighbors and figure out what the right answer is. Again, with these clickers, it's just the last click that you do. You can always change your, change your score. Or change your choice, excuse me. Not change your score, that's a different story. Yes, it is C, only 92%. We'll get 100 eventually. Um, I'll see you on Friday for review. There will not be clicker questions on Friday.